Ariane Antonescu. I'm going to share with you a bit that I've learned in this recent um, midwifery her story course that I've been taking and also my visions, hopes and dreams for midwifery future. Um, this midwifery her story course has been pretty intense for me. There's a lot of feelings inside that got all riled up. Um, and one thing that stuck out stood out to me in this course is how a lot of midwifery past and present is influenced by physicians and medical community and government <laughs> like restrictions and it was just really challenging for me to read about all the just closing in on what midwives can and can't do because midwifery is one of the oldest professions. There are glyphs of pictures depicting a midwife helping um, on the walls in an Egypt cave, like or a pyramid, excuse me. But it's like one of the oldest professions as a, as a people, we give birth. That's what we do so that we can keep going on. And so there have always been birth supporters. And then to think that people started restricting that and saying like, you can't support birth. Oh, mom, you can't decide who's at your birth anymore because there are laws. Like that, that was really challenging for me. So just putting that out there right away because it might come through in my little chat. So in the beginning, all births were home births. With birth support, without birth support, um, I believe that as a culture, as a, as a people, we all knew more about birth than we do now. It's just something that was a part of life. And so I think it was easier to get birth support because so many people knew about birth and it wasn't like hidden away anywhere. It was very much in our face and something that we would support each other with. Um, in colonial times, midwifery was still really well respected and birth was more of a community event, which is fascinating to me. So family and neighbors might come and possibly they're not in the room with the birthing woman. I don't know. Possibly they're out doing chores, taking care of the woman's other kids, um, taking care of the family. But neighbors would take on each other's responsibilities as children were born so that the mom can heal and the family can adjust. So that was pretty awesome to read about. And it's very fascinating to think about birth as a social event because I don't see that anymore. And in fact, a lot of people are like, oh, women need to be in a dark room all by themselves. And here in colonial times, it was more of a social event. So I would like to learn more about that. Like what, what does that mean? Were people together and partying? I don't know. So that was pretty fascinating. I loved hearing how the neighbors would take care of each other. And then that would be reciprocated when other neighbors gave birth. Midwives were actually teaching physicians physicians who wanted to learn about birth. Midwives were teaching them. Um, there are a lot of documented, like, good relationships between midwives and physicians. They both had a lot to learn from each other. And then eventually, it's, the midwives were, like, pushed aside, I guess. Like, oh, we can do this now. You can go do something else. Like, I don't know, go cook or something. So that was already... <laughs> challenging. It's like, okay, so midwives teaching physicians, and then eventually physicians trying to get midwives out of the role so that they have more clients for themselves. I think of that as a scarcity way of thinking. Um, there's not enough for all of us, just that scarcity mentality. Therefore, I need to restrict what you're doing so that I have more for me. And the opposite of that would be an abundance way of thinking, like there are enough clients for all of us. You know, lots of people give birth. The more midwives there are, the better off people are at finding a midwife that's a good match for them. So that would be more the abundance way of thinking. But the scarcity way of thinking was in works at that time. And again, 
not for everyone. This is kind of an overview and it's usually the victors that write history. So we don't always hear the stories about the physicians that did try to keep midwives working as well. But I know they're out there, or they were. Um, so midwives were like part of culture. So people weren't easily swayed into letting go of them. One thing that some physicians did was they started encouraging each other to get into governmental positions so that they had more power to restrict not only midwives but themselves. So there were a lot of doctors. Anybody could go to a medical school for, I forget how long it was, three months, six months, something, learn bloodletting and all that good stuff. And then they could practice as a doctor. So what physicians did was they entered governmental positions with their agenda to raise the standards of education. And what this meant, it sounds great, right? Like, yeah, we should all learn more, that's awesome. But what it meant was shutting down the majority of schools, so only a few peppered the country. It meant stopping women, people of color, and immigrants from going to medical school by placing so many barriers in front of being able to go to medical school. Before this, there were a lot of women and people of color and immigrants going to medical school. But then once the school shut down and there were all these prerequisites like speaking different languages and having so much time to dedicate that's unpaid, like pretty much only wealthy white people, men, could go. And so they restricted themselves first, again with a scarcity mentality because there were so many doctors, people were afraid that they wouldn't have enough clients. So they restricted their education, which restricted the people that could go to be doctors. Once this was successful, they went after other professions. And what other people would be charged with, their offense would be practicing medicine without a license. So they would go after osteopaths, um, midwives, really anybody who might be working with people who otherwise maybe would have gone to a doctor. So again, it was scarcity thinking, and it was also, and I should say is, because it's still happening, but it's also this mentality of my way is the right way. I know better than you do, so you do not get to choose the type of care that you're getting. Instead, I will choose what type of care is available for you. That's just bizarre to me to think people can't figure out their own wants and wills and be able to do that. Um, so yes, the medical association got really strong. They had different doctors in um, government. They were able to pass all these rules and regulations. It was still a bit hard to get midwives out of the picture because again, that was way better. <laughs> And it was part of the culture, like your mom maybe was, had this one midwife and then your aunt and you and your kids and it was just part of the culture. One time period that I think was super influential for midwifery, it was the industrial revolution era. This is a time when land was, it was expensive to live on the land and farm. So a lot of people moved to the city in smaller houses or apartments, um, really crammed together, not necessarily around family anymore. That family structure wasn't there for you. So who's going to take care of your kids when you have a baby? Who's going to call the midwife? Um, usually the husband was off at work, so he could no longer go get the midwife if you were in birth. You would have to rely on somebody else. And maybe you didn't know anybody else in your neighborhood or Maybe people spoke different languages than you, but it was just a whole different way of going about it and people had to adjust. There was factory work, poor conditions, super long hours. And then this like factory mentality kind of took over. And I believe part of it was like sleep deprivation, poor environment, obviously polluted, people not getting out in the sun, being away from their community. 
all these things played into making this like factory mentality of I need to work really hard for a living and people weren't making a lot of money um, and that birth needed to go along with certain times which is what started to be implemented in the hospitals. And who knows, maybe in midwifery practices as well, that was starting to be thought of, possibly. Um, but it was fascinating learning about this time period because before this, before the Industrial Revolution, hospitals were not a place anybody wanted to go. It was like the place for someone who didn't have a family, a very unfortunate soul. And... During the Industrial Revolution, people didn't have space in their houses and possibly didn't have the emotional capacity anymore because they had to deal with all these other things to take care of their own family. And that also extended to birth. Maybe there wasn't room for birth. Maybe you didn't have people around you to take care of your kids. So then people who could afford it started to possibly go to other places to give birth. And midwives adjusted to this by working more with the poor population. A lot of midwives in this time were immigrants and working with immigrants and working with um, the poor population. In the same Industrial Revolution era, there was really poor mortality rates. And a study was done, I believe, in New York to see why. <laughs> And everybody, well, not everybody, but some people were guessing that it would be midwifery that was the problem. And instead, it found the opposite, that midwifery care had really great results compared to hospital care. And what they did was some people, like, turned the study around on midwives and said, we, would, we at the hospital would be better at what we do with maternal care if midwives would stop taking our testing subjects. So basically, like, the poor and destitute should be learning objects at the hospital. It's really a gross quote. I didn't, I didn't say it. I didn't quote it right. But the quote is pretty gross. Um, so anyway, the Industrial Revolution, to me, was a huge changing point, not only in midwifery, but in our culture. We seem to become more consumer-based and linear thinking and less going with the seasons and intuitive. Um, of course, not everybody lived in the city. And outside of the city, midwifery definitely was still needed because not all physicians and doctors wanted the hours that midwifery brings to it or the traveling. So... So it took longer for midwifery care to change in the countryside, I believe. So in the north of the United States, legislation was used to um, make midwifery basically illegal. And then in the southern states, they knew that they couldn't get rid of it as fast because there, was, there were more people living outside the cities, um, quite, a few, quite a large poor population. And if they got rid of midwifery, a lot of women would be left without care. So instead, what they decided to do, and a great book to read about this is, let me look, In the Way of Our Grandmothers. Yes, In the Way of Our Grandmothers. Down in Florida, there was this whole plan that got put into place to basically regulate, educate, and then eliminate midwives. Midwives had a lot of propaganda put up against them. Women's health magazines would write about how midwives are ignorant and dirty, and they would play on racial stereotypes. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of propaganda out there to try to change people's minds about midwifery care and birthing at home and instead go to the hospital, which became a lucrative business, hospital care. So there was money involved, money, greed, scarcity thinking. Um, midwifery care, or mid midwives tried to really adapt to a lot of the situations. Some fought it, some fought legislation and laws, 
um, others thought, oh, they're recognizing us. Yeah, let's let's have laws and regulations. Let's be licensed because then we're like a true profession. Not realizing the goal of the license was to restrict, educate, and eliminate. <laughs> some caught on eventually, and some really fell into it because they're like, ah, oh, we can't beat them, join them. It is better to regulate ourselves than to have someone else regulate us, so let's do it quicker. So there are midwives that are fighting for mandatory licensing in states that don't have it yet. And yeah, I guess there are many different ways to think about that. I'll, I'll go on to my vision of the future of midwifery. I also want to put like hopes wishes and that is that we stop playing the game what if we stop playing the laws and regulations and like constricting other people and saying you can't choose who's at your birth and who your caregivers are we will give you options you can choose within these options and that's it otherwise you're going against the law what if we stop doing that and let women choose where to give birth, with whom to give birth? Let's stop thinking people can't make decisions for themselves and stop regulating each other. And let's just change the game. Change the rules to the game, don't even play the game, play a different game, I don't know. But my goal is that midwives can somehow come together and support each other even though we have different views. Like every, every person has a different view than another person. We, none of us mesh totally. But let's see our common ground. And I believe our common ground is our clients, are our clients. Our clients care, our clients' rights, our clients being happy with their birth. My goal in life is not about meeting someone else's standards of care. My goals in life are to work within myself and figure out what I want and what I need and work with other people, figure out what they want and they need and figure out how we can do that together or not. Not every midwife, not every client is right for every midwife and vice versa. So I guess my goals are that we stop regulating each other, we stop bad-mouthing each other as midwives, as people, <laughs> that we stop playing the game of rules and regulations and my way is right and what you're doing can be prosecuted because you're giving this client what they want, which is someone to take care of them during their postpartum, their prenatals, their labor. You can't do that. Those are the type of things I would like to see us let go of. And I don't know exactly how to get there. Maybe my, my goal is to look within myself and see where I'm regulating my own actions and also look at where I'm regulating others. We'll start with like my kids, my husband, and close relationships, and then keep going out from there. I do think focusing on our common goal is helpful. Um, also, nonviolent communication is something that resonates with me and I feel the more I use that, maybe other people will use that as well and we can again find that common ground and figure out what is it? What is it that we can meet? Where can we meet and how can we work together? Um, the teacher of the Her Story class wrote a blog. I will link it below. And in it, she writes that law follows culture. And I liked this. One of her ideas is that we can help shift the culture. So if we can sh shift the culture, starting with ourselves, our families, and the people around us, we can, in the shift, let me be clear with this, in the shift, I mean helping people see that people can make their own decisions, that we shouldn't put our will on other people, that others should be able to follow their will without putting that on other people. So I believe that women should be able to birth 
how they want to, where they want to, um, with whom they want to or not. They can do it alone as well if that's what they want. And I think the more we offer those opportunities to other people, like we stop restricting them and show them, yes, I believe that you can make decisions for yourself. And also taking the opportunities to talk about home birth and just shifting the awareness of home birth. Because a lot of people do believe the propaganda that was put out and then kind of passed along in our culture that midwifery isn't safe, even though that's not what the studies show. So how can we shift the conversation? How can we change like these ingrained ideas and just open it up? So I guess there are more questions than answers in my vision for the future of midwifery. Um, I do know for myself how I'm going to start going about it, making sure, making sure to talk well about the midwives around me. No gossiping. I mean, it's one thing to state facts. It's another to gossip. So no bad mouthing. Um, to honor clients and their wishes and to really be transparent in what my goals are, help clients be transparent in what their goals are, and try to meet together. And we'll see how that goes <laughs> as this uh, midwifery journey continues for me. Well, if you're still with me at the end here, thanks for listening. And I'll put a few um, links and suggested readings down below if you want to read more about midwifery licensing. A great book is Making Midwives Legal, if you want to know more about licensing and how that came about and what what research shows about what license has done to the midwifery practice, which might surprise a lot of people. So, thanks a lot. Bye.